Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. Luke 23, 34. If you examine the context of the preceding verse and the subsequent verse, this verse is sandwiched between a very profound set of activities that are playing out at the cross. So when I was meditating on the reflection for today, I always ask myself, what could be a good working title of the sharing that I have for you today? And one of the things that really struck me was a phenomenon that plays out called the Stockholm Syndrome. Stockholm Syndrome is, is a psychological trauma kind of a, a, a phenomenon that plays out in hijacker situations or whenever somebody is captured and kept in captivity. We all know of plane hijackings, we all know of uh, 2611 in India where a few uh, terrorists took over the whole city of Mumbai. Whenever there are captors held captive, the psychological attachment to the aggressors is called Stockholm Syndrome. If you really look at the words that Jesus spoke on the cross, the very first words which spoke about forgiveness, Father forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. It sounds a bit like Jesus is having a bit of a kinship or a sense of attachment to his aggressors. And then if you see the second part, he says, for they do not know what they are doing, that ignorance is the foundation from which such uh, behavior sprang. So there are a few thoughts that I want to share with you, but I just want to re remind ourselves that this is not just the words that we share during Good Friday and Easter. Each time we come to the communion table and we receive the blood, bread and, and the wine, drink this blood for this is for the forgiveness of your sins. So the very first word that Jesus spoke on the cross was not spoken out of Stockholm Syndrome. It was out of a messianic mission that began with the birth of Jesus Christ that culminated in the cross. So it's not Stockholm Syndrome, it's messianic mission. The very purpose that Jesus came into this world was to restore us and bring forgiveness on us. Turn your minds to John chapter 1. John chapter 1 verse 27 says, Look, the Lamb of God. And shortly after that in verse 29 and 30, the disciples look at Jesus and say, Look, the Lamb of God is coming. Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of, sins of the world. So what we saw at Golgotha is actually words spoken as a man who was on a mission fulfilling it and that's the, the first significance of that word. I want to talk to you about how this is not just a theological concept but a very deeply disturbing, almost counter-human, counter-intuitive behavior that Jesus is demonstrating. You know, uh, I, I don't know how many of you watch TV and uh, they are tuned to the local soap opera operas that get uh, shown on American television, but uh, one of the most powerful very popular seasons that, are, that is playing out on ABC television is a series called Revenge. And it's about a young lady who just tries to take revenge on all who have agreed her family. Revenge is a very powerful feeling that every human being can relate to. In the year 2008, in uh, India, a very unusual incident unfolded. Priyanka Gandhi, the daughter of Sonia Gandhi made a very quiet, off the radar, off the public kind of a visit to a jail in Bellwood to meet one of the surviving members of the bomb squad, the suicide squad that killed her father. And when Priyanka Gandhi came face to face with Nalini Sridharan, the lady who was serving lifetime in that jail, after she left, that the accused, the guilty one, told reporters that after this girl came and met me, it's as if all my sins were washed away. 
It's a powerful story of why would one want to forgive who took away the life of your father? Not in a very simple way, but in the most gruesome, horrible, bloody, gory way. There's something counter-human about forgiveness. Think of the mind, um, the behavior demonstrated by Nelson Mandela, who in the highest point of his life when he was being sworn in as the head of this country, he invited the captors and the jail wardens and the, the sergeants who troubled them and tormented them for years. And no sermon on forgiveness can be complete in an Indian context if you don't recall Gladys Staines, who lost her husband and two wonderful boys in that gruesome carnage in Orissa. What makes this human heart capable of forgiving in, in, when revenge is the natural instinct. So let me just recall three thoughts and, and I want to stick to time because um, I always believe that uh, uh, when you stick to time, even if you don't win the affection, you know, you at least get the appreciation of the audience. Uh, the word forgiveness is mentioned about 47 times in the, in the entire Bible, 17 times in the Old and 33 times in the New. So that just kind of gives you the sense that Jesus and, and all, all his disciples thrived on this notion of forgiveness. Uh, whereas in the Old Testament it was all about propitiation and peace offerings and, and trying to do the right after the wrong was done, it was Jesus who once for all paid the price for forgiveness. Just in case we think that these are words spoken out of delirium, hallucinating Jesus, just like the passage that was read from Isaiah 53, it was prophesied and the words were fulfilled. It was no mere accident, my friends. It was simple fulfillment of prophecy, just like many of his life's incidents, like the city where he was going to be born came for, to fulfillment and fruition, just like the, the, the shortly after this words is the place where all the his clothes were put into a lot and lots were drawn. That shows you the human behavior of how the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords who promised to change the world has been crucified and then that human selfish behavior was played out. So this is not by accident. If you read the last words of Isaiah 53, you realize that God was specifically appointing this hour for a time of intercession. So Jesus was interceding for his people. So the first one was a cry of uh, fulfillment of prophecy. The second one was he was identifying with you and me. Now if you read Matthew chapter 8, there's a, there's a man who was brought with palsy to Jesus and Jesus in his usual style shocked the audience by saying, son, your sins are forgiven. All the religious leaders were perplexed. They were wanting to see a miracle of healing. But instead, Jesus said, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now, why did Jesus, who had the power to forgive people right there, ask his father at that time? Think about it. He, he forgave many people. Remember the, the lady who was caught in adultery. People want to stone her, but he changes their paradigm and says, He who is without sin, let him throw the first step. In other words, he's saying, the only one who's capable of pronouncing forgiveness is me. Then he sends her and says, daughter, your sins are forgiven, go and sin. So how a master, a messiah, who came to the single mission of forgiving, asked his father as an intercessor, think about that. This cry identified us with, he's relating to us and he's saying, on behalf of these people, Father, I seek forgiveness for them. Because shortly after that comes the second word where he is finding a sense of alienation with, with God, but this was the last prayer that he seemed to have sought where, before he felt that his time was running out on this earth. And then what Jesus did was very counterintuitive from a human perspective. You read in the book of Esther, Haman, and plotting to kill all the Jews. And then 
you see the story of redemption remarkably played out where Hannah himself was killed on the gallows. You read the story of Samson. In his last wish, he asks for one last swan song, so to speak, saying, I want to go in a blaze of glory. God gives strength and he destroys the whole temple full of Philistines. So there is fundamentally something enjoyable. There's fundamentally something almost legitimate about getting revenge because you're almost legitimately saying that an eye for an eye is absolutely right. And, and you know that that was embodied in the law. But Jesus on the Sermon on the Mount says, I have come not to abolish the law, but to rise above the law, to, to fulfill the law. And in me, in the cross, all the law is covered and, and you find a higher law in your You know, one of the most beautiful ex explanations of, of the cross was given by somebody who said, at the cross you find grace and mercy. And I don't want to get into the theological aspects, but in simple terms, grace is receiving what we do not deserve, which is the gift of life, the gift of salvation, the gift of forgiveness. And mercy is not getting what we deserve, which is death and punishment. And if we were to be accounted for every secret sin, I do not have the moral right to come here and stand and preach. We are all sinners and we have fallen short of the glory of God. Grace and mercy rain down at the cross through this prayer. Now you can, you can keep arguing about how effect, effectively um, our lives can be impacted through this word. Jesus had no false notions about human capability. Many times they came to seize him and make him king, but he would not trust himself because he knew what was in the hearts of men, the Bible says. Right at Gethsemane, a beautiful scenario unfolded. The Roman Emperor, Empire, with all its might, marched into Gethsemane. He had encounters with two groups there. His own intimate coterie, the disciples, the, the near and dear ones, whom he asked to pray, let him down by not praying. So even in his most lonely moments, he, he was let down by his friends. And then the Roman Empire came looking for him. He goes and embraces them and says, whom are you looking for? Then they say, we are looking for the Messiah, Jesus. And he says, I am he. And you know, the, the whole Roman Empire fell to, its, fell to the ground. In that symbolic gesture, a man who could bring a political supreme power to its feet down onto the ground. And a man who trained three years of his life was let down by his own people at Gethsemane and subsequently at Golgotha. Jesus was a very lonely man. And the weight of the world sinning, the, the sin of all of the humankind weighing on his shoulders, the very first thing that he asked God is, Father, Forgive them, for they know not what they do. The impact of what he said could not be um, calculated unless you go to Acts chapter 5, where in Pentecost. These few disciples who let him down in Gethsemane were standing in Pentecost and looking right into the eyes of these 5,000 people, 3,000 people who were saved later, said, This Jesus whom you crucified, the, the whole paradigm had changed from out of fear into absolute fearlessness, from a sense of hopelessness into absolute conviction where they could look down and say, you have crucified. So there is, there is never any doubt or hesitation about where or what the impact of the cross ought to be other than for forgiveness. Martin Luther, the, the founder of Protestantism, um, was named after uh, another saint called Saint Martin. The devil once wanted to deceive uh, him in a dream and apparently he had a dream and the devil came to him in the form of the shape of Jesus and started to deceive him. Almost half awake, Saint Martin said, so if you are truly Jesus, show me your hands. At which time the devil vanished. So the power of the cross is all about forgiveness. So what does it mean for you and me? What do these words mean as it 
implies on a practical day-to-day -day basis. The first challenge I want to remind you is that we need to change our lives from a sense of possessing to generosity. Uh, Oswald Chambers wrote a book, an, an essay called A Magnificent Obsession. Christ ought to be our magnificent obsession who just gave his life as a, a generous gift to all mankind. If you, if you, uh, if you study uh, the way he gave himself to those in a group of 12, it reminds us that no matter where we are planted in the church, we ought to give. It's easy to give uh, a little bit of money here and there, but it's very difficult to give yourself. Can you give yourself to, to the work of the Lord? The second thing is, if you s remember, forgive them for they know not what they do. Ignorance continues to be a big challenge that we as disciples always need to battle. In fact, Peter in his episode, 2 Peter 3, 18 says, but grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. For some reason, I find that grace and knowledge are linked. You can never grow in God's grace if your knowledge of God has not increased. You cannot survive today on yesterday's manna. You need to constantly go back to the source of Jesus Christ, of, of the Word of God, and consistently, every day, grow in knowledge. Which is why the book of Proverbs says, where there is no vision and knowledge, people perish. If you want to continue to be an effective disciple of Jesus Christ, and embody that sense of forgiveness that he talked about that can come only through the grace that we get that reminds us how frail and evil we are and how grace is a desperate measure that we all need. And finally, the challenge that we all have is from, from a sense of we, we need to become servant leaders. What do I mean by that? No sermon on Good Friday is incomplete without referring to Philippians chapter 2. He who did not consider equality with God as something to be grasped or possessed, willingly gave himself to die even a most undignified death on the cross. To me, that represents the paradigm of complete servanthood. The world we live in is dominated by the devil. The paradigms of the world are serpent leadership. You only are trained. I'm, I'm a leadership coach, as you know, and I'm constantly challenging people's paradigms about how the world perceives leadership. There are 10,000 books on Amazon on leadership, but if you look for a word for a servant, you'll probably find one or two. The world has a different notion of service, whereas we as Christians need to know how to constantly keep giving. So change the paradigm from servant leadership to servant, servant, servant leadership where you are willing to give yourself just like our, our Savior has given himself on the cross. The best example that we can always constantly go back to is in that beautiful parable that the Lord reminded us. Peter asked him, Lord, how many times should I forget? It is not an accounting number. But he, he changes the paradigm by saying, the number of times you need to forgive is actually dependent on the, number, the deepest understanding you have of what grace you receive. So if you receive little grace, you'll forgive very little. If you receive much grace, you will forgive a lot. You might say it's easy to preach. In fact, when I, uh, our beloved President Funny gave me this verse, I felt that this was the most challenging verse of all to practice, simply because you know, if, if I pick the word I thirst, uh, it probably is easy to preach about that and, and drink some water um, without trivializing. But if you see the, the, the implications of this verse, what it means for you and me and what it means for our families, what it means for our church, where we, we are constantly getting splintered on issues, this verse reminds us that grace and mercy reign on at the cross. And if we don't continue to uh, extend that, we will, we, will, we will be creating us here. Let me close with a personal uh, story. Some of you might know I come from a huge family, and uh, in our family a few years ago, about 12 years ago, there was a huge uh, fight related to property. I was already overseas, so I, 
I was not fully aware of what's happening, but my parents uh, had to enter a legal battle with some of their uh, uh, siblings, family members. It really troubled me that many of us who were practicing Christians, some of us leaders in churches, some of us holding responsible positions, had to go to a legal battle to resolve uh, what could have been an easily uh, resolvable family dispute. But as years go by, in India, as you know, the legal system takes many years. But finally, I, I took the bad matter into my own hands and I just told everybody that, listen, you're not setting a bad, good example by, by doing what you're doing. Generations are suffering. Families and cousins are looking at each other in silence. They're bad mouthing. This is not a Christian way. So I took a step of pulling out of that legal battle and we said, look, if this can be resolved peacefully in a Christian manner, let it be so, but we don't want anything to do with this legal battle. There was a lot of money involved. Many people thought that I was being a naive, ideal, somewhat dreamy kind of a person. Some, some might even have called me a fool. But if you do not practice forgiveness, then you have no right to call yourself a Christian because Christian, some, a follower of Christ is somebody who gave his life on the cross as a price to restore forgiveness from the Father. May the Lord honor these uh, words and remind us continuously that we need to be a forgiving generation. May the Lord bless us.